So welcome everybody and uh, today we're going to be talking about homeopathic remedies for home prescribing. I know some of you know uh, a fair bit about homeopathy already and for some of you it may be completely new to you and I guess you're here to maybe you've heard that homeopathy is a very safe uh, and effective alternative treatment and want to be able to use it for your family uh, in the home. Many of you may actually come to uh, homeopathy uh, to study it full time. A lot of people do once they get an interest in it, once, they, once it gets a hold of them, uh, it, it often doesn't let go. So, so some of you who are just starting out learning about homeopathy may actually end up uh, practicing to be a homeopath. For others, they just want to be able to use homeopathy safely and effectively in their home. And that's what this course is designed to do. This five-hour seminar isn't intended to give you the training to deal with serious or complex complaints, but at the end of the day you should feel comfortable and confident to treat uh, cuts, bruises, bites, stings, burns, colds, coughs quite happily uh, for your friends and family. So our introduction uh, today, first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about the theory uh, behind homeopathy uh, and the background to homeopathy. And once we've uh, given you a little understanding of the whys and wherefores and some of the, the, the principles of homeopathy, we're going to be starting on the remedies, which is where it gets really interesting. So we're going to start off by having a look at uh, what is health? So according to the Webster Dictionary, the meaning of health is freedom from defect, pain or disease. So clearly it defines health as what it isn't rather than what it is. Uh, as homeopaths, uh, we see health as a, a positive state of well-being. Uh, and true health has to be thought of in a positive, dynamic term, not simply as the absence of disease. It doesn't just mean the absence of something. It isn't a question of, well, you're not ill, so you therefore must be healthy. Uh, and that kind of sums up the current orthodox uh, ideas uh, and this is part of the reason when you see your doctor that you're rarely given any advice on la lifestyle or diet or any other beneficial changes you might be making in order to make you more healthy. You're not sick, you don't need anything is the view. And health, of course, is not just absence of disease, uh, but it's a positive dynamic state of well-being that makes it hard for illness to get a foothold. Part of what we do as homeopaths is we try to keep people healthy, try to educate people about their health. And I think that's a very important part of, of being a homeopath and wanting to keep, your, your, uh, keep illness at bay. So the homeopathic view of, of health is actually quite different from the orthodox view of health. And the homeopathic uh, definition of health can be covered in just six words. The freedom to adapt to change. A healthy person adapts according to the circumstances. It sounds a little bit strange sometimes that health is all about adapting. Uh, and yet it's hard to convey how accurate this actually is. On a very basic level, our body is adapting all the time. If we're hot, our body sweats and puts mechanisms in place uh, to attempt to cool us, to adapt to the temperature. If we're cold, we start to shiver, so the little hairs on our uh, body rise up and attempt to conserve some heat and to generate some heat. Uh, so on an internal level, this process of adapting uh, is going on all the time. When we meet an infection, our immune system is making antibodies. So, so health really means that our body is able to adapt to many adverse circumstances. And homeopathy defines health as freedom on a physical, mental, emotional and spiritual level where the entire body operates in an integrated and harmonious way for optimum efficiency, allowing us to respond appropriately, not only to the environment, but to anything uh, that comes into our lives. The, the WHO, the World Health Organization, have recently said that their view of health is the ability to adapt and self-manage in the face of social, physical and emotional challenges. 
So it seems that orthodox medicine is perhaps starting to catch up, although I think it will be a long time before it filters down to, to uh, our, our GPs. So it's about our body adapting and keeping the status quo. But for health, we need to be aware of that and to help our body. If we bludgeon our body into submission by eating donuts three times a day, our, we're going to compromise our body's adapting mechanisms, our blood sugar balance. So we have to help our bodies uh, in the adapting processes and not, not hinder them. So that's a homeopathic view of health, that if we are able to adapt to circumstances and the, um, the homeostasis is maintained in our body, we will stay healthy. So the opposite, what, what is disease? So disease is defined as a condition of the living animal or plant body or one of its parts that impairs normal functioning and is typically manifested by distinguishing signs and symptoms. We all know that's what disease is really, but to understand the difference between the homeopathic approach and conventional approach, we actually need to understand their different approach to the symptoms that we express when our body is ill. So orthodox medicine it views your symptoms almost as if the symptoms were the disease. Uh, the symptoms need to be removed. Uh, for example, in a case of arthritis, a patient could be given painkillers or anti-inflammatory medicine. But suppression of the symptoms does not cure the disease. And modern medicine is pretty much based on the suppression of symptoms. Um, the painkillers or the anti-inflammatories that you get, they don't cure the arthritis, although they may help to make you feel better because you're out uh, of, of quite such uh, strong pain. We would call this the law of opposites. We are given anti-inflammatories for arthritis, antacids for gastritis, antihistamines uh, for allergies, antibiotics for infection, and antiemetics for sickness. So this is kind of the law of opposites, that whatever your body is doing, modern medicine tries to uh, oppose that. Um, the law of opposites, as opposed to what we're going to come on to with homeopathy, which is the law of similars. But the law of opposites, it, it may apply in certain situations. If you are dehydrated, you need to rehydrate by drinking more water. If you're too cold and hypothermic, you need to find and conserve heat. These, in these situations, the law of opposites makes sense because the law of opposites may help our body to maintain homeostasis. But these adverse conditions where the law of opposites applies, they're not illnesses. Uh, they may create balance in certain disorders and can certainly be temporarily helpful. And sometimes we do need to replace something that isn't uh, being made. In, it may be somebody isn't making enough thyroxin. But the approach does not cure illness. And when you think about when you go to the doctors with arthritis, with migraines, with eczema, basically what the doctors do, not in all situations, but in the vast majority uh, of chronic complaints, is that they manage your symptoms and they may give you medications that you may be expected to be on for your whole life. And of course, those medications have side effects and will cause further problems uh, with your health overall. So it's how we look at the body's symptoms that really m brings the divide in between the more orthodox approach and the homeopathic approach. And again, that's not to say that the two approaches uh, don't have some crossover points and uh, it's actually possible for them to work together. But the way homeopathy views symptoms, they see our symptoms as a way of uh, bringing our attention to disease. We say nature's warnings of troubles from within. They're a way our for our body to try and reimpose order and balance and they're not the disease itself. So symptoms, even things like sweating when we have a fever, they're our body's way of trying to cool us down. An example might be if you had food poisoning. If you eat something that's full of nasty bacteria, the diarrhea and the vomiting come because your body wants to get rid of it as quickly as possible. So your symptoms are actually your body's way of saying, I've got to get rid of this. They are not the disease itself. The disease is the bacteria uh, that's causing this, but the symptoms are your body's way of trying to help. 
trying to get rid of it quickly before it can affect you further. So we see the symptoms in a, in a very, very different way, um, that they are part of the way of trying to balance and we use them to try and find where the central disturbance is so that the body can actually start to, to heal itself. Sometimes when we suppress a symptom of disease, we may drive it deeper into the body. This doesn't usually happen with acute problems, which is really the focus of our, our talk today. But it may happen, for instance, if people suppress eczema, it may aggravate uh, an underlying asthma. So this is something as homeopaths we are, are very careful about. We believe that especially in acute diseases, the body is always working in its own best interests and that we need to listen to the symptoms, but not just try to suppress them. See them as uh, a roadmap to uh, how we're going to help to get our patient better. Founder of homeopathy was Samuel Hahnemann. And it was Samuel Hahnemann that first coined the term homeopathy. And the word homeopathy in Greek means similar to the suffering. And that really says most of, of what needs to be said about homeopathy, that we are trying to find something that is similar to the suffering. It treats the diseases that it seeks to cure by the administration of a minute dose of a remedy that would, in a larger dose, produce those very symptoms in a healthy person. We'll examine this a little bit more in detail later. The law of similars was actually previously described by many, many old physicians, Hippocrates, Paracelsus. It was utilized by lots of different cultures, including the Mayans, the Chinese, the Greeks. Native American Indians, but it was Hahnemann who actually codified and um, the, brought the law of similars into a systematic medical science. What happened way back when, this is 200 years ago, Samuel Hahnemann was a doctor and he was a doctor in the times when um, people were bled to within an inch of their lives for whatever was wrong with them and purged. It was what they called heroic medicine. Uh, and it didn't have that many answers. But one of the answers it did have and was very successful in was in the treatment of malaria. And malaria was treated back then, 200 years ago, as it's treated now, with quinine. And this interested uh, Samuel Hahnemann, who was a man with a very inquiring mind, and he wondered why quinine cured malaria when many other eggs and plagues went without anything uh, to improve their symptoms or get them better or, or give them any ease of their suffering. So he got some quinine for himself and he started to take some of it every day. And after a period of time of taking quinine every day, he fell ill. And he fell ill with what he thought was malaria. And he couldn't understand how he could have malaria when he was already taking quinine, which was known not only to cure malaria but prevent it. So he stopped taking the quinine and within a few days his symptoms had abated. So he wondered whether the fact that the quinine could produce the symptoms of malaria in him who was healthy was the reason why it could cure malaria in people who were sick. So he repeated his experiments with his wife, Melanie, and he gave Melanie quinine every day until she fell ill. Uh, and then he stopped dozing and she got better. And then he tried it on his friends and possibly even his children uh, until he knew for certain that quinine produced the symptoms of malaria in a healthy person. So this was what set him on the road to homeopathy. He knew he needed to find a way of making it less toxic so that people didn't develop the symptoms, which is where the dilution process started. Uh, but uh, China, which is the name we give to quinine, holds a place uh, dear in the heart of many homeopaths because it was the first homeopathic remedy uh, that Samuel Hahnemann uh, used and proved and it was what uh, pr provided the spark uh, for the beginnings of homeopathy. We're briefly going to talk about the principles of homeopathy. Uh, before we get on to the remedies themselves. And there are four basic principles of homeopathy. We've touched on the first one, the law of similars, similars that like cures like. Then we have the single remedy, the minimum dose, and the law of cure. 
So I'm going to go through these. So the law of similars. Here we can see a lady chopping an onion. What happens when you chop an onion? We all know that. I'm sure we have, we've all done uh, chopped an onion at some point and we know that we may get sore eyes. Our eyes might stream and we might get really lots of uh, tears, lacrimation, and very stingy eyes and then our nose might start to run and our throat might be affected and we uh, have to go away from the onion, wash our hands, open the windows. There are so many things of old wives tales of how to stop an onion stinging your eyes, you know, put a spoon between your teeth, do it while the tap's running. Uh, there's loads of them because chopping onions, strong onions can be really quite uncomfortable. So that's the symptom that a raw onion can produce. So when we see somebody with those symptoms, possibly they have a cold or hay fever and their eyes are running, their nose is dripping like a tap, they may sneeze, they may have a slightly sore throat. We know that the remedy Allium Sepa, which is prepared from an onion, will be the remedy uh, that will, will cure them in a homeopathic prescription. So what we're looking at, there are, there are thousands of homeopathic remedies in day-to-day -day use. Uh, each of those substances has had a proving, which we're going to talk a little bit about later on. So we know what, the, what symptoms they produce in a healthy person, so we know what symptoms they are going to be able uh, to cure in a sick person. The second thing, which is very similar, we said the law of similars, the second thing on that list was like cures like. There's not very much difference between the law of similars and like cures like, but just to explain a little bit further. This is a, an example of, of like cures like. Arsenic is a poison. It's a deadly poison. If somebody ingests a, a crude dose of arsenic, they are going to have the following symptoms. They are going to feel dreadfully ill. They're going to have horrible uh, and very profuse vomiting. They're going to have diarrhea, watery diarrhea with a lot of stomach cramps. They're going to feel weak, weak as if they just have no energy and they really need to lie down. Um, they're going to feel cold, bone cold, and eventually they're going to collapse. That's what happens if somebody is poisoned with arsenic. So we use arsenic and homeopathic pr remedies are prepared and we're going to go through this as well in a very dilute form so they have no toxic effects left. But what we know is that those symptoms that will be caused in a healthy person will be the symptoms that we can use arsenicum to cure in a sick person. In other words, if we have a member of our family who gets struck down by norovirus or eats a dodgy bit of chicken and gets food poisoning, if their symptoms are vomiting, diarrhea, which is very watery, they feel very weak, they feel very, very cold and they feel close to collapse, we know that if we give them our Senecam album from our first aid kit, that is going to set them right in a short period of time. So uh, uh, this, uh, similar to the suffering, like cures like, is telling us that on being given a dose of something whose effects resemble our original symptoms, our body will redouble its efforts to throw off the, the disease. So this is the, the central principle of homeopathy, like cures like. It's what homeopathy means, similar to the suffering. Does that make sense for everybody? As well as that very basic aspect of the law of similars, um, we require the remedy to be very similar, not broadly similar, but as similar as we can make it. So when two people are ill, an example of this might be two people have the same name condition. They both go to their doctor because they've both got really severe bronchitis. The chances are that their doctor will give them the very same thing. He'll give them a, a, an antibiotic uh, to try and help to clear their chest. So if they come to see a homeopath and they say, I've got terrible bronchitis, we don't have the one remedy that is similar to bronchitis because what we're looking at is the expression of the symptoms of the patient. So if two people here have uh, bronchitis, um, you might be very cold and, and, and chilly, you might be very hot and, and feverish, uh, you might be coughing up yellow, you might be coughing up green, you might be much worse at night, can't sleep at all, you might sleep fine at night, not cough at night, but be coughing all day. You might be better if the window's open, the air's cool, you might cough more as soon as the air gets cold. So you can see that although 
two people have bronchitis, their experience of it is very individual. So that means that they would be given different remedies, each of them, because what we're looking at are the symptoms they express. And this is what we do all the way through with everything. With all of the complaints that we're talking about today, uh, we're going to see that there are many remedies that can be used for that complaint, depending on the symptom picture that develops in the person. So the individuality of the symptoms that the person is uh, experiencing are really, really important. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how we take a case and how we ascertain what those symptoms are so that we can match them really closely to the most similar remedy, to the remedy that is most similar to the suffering of the patient. Does that also make sense? We tend to use one remedy at a time. This is very, it's what they call classical homeopathy. It's one of the tenets of homeopathy, the single remedy. It's important to remember that the remedy itself doesn't cure. It's our own body that actually cures us. Our body has an innate ability to heal. If we cut ourselves, it heals. If we have a cough or a cold, usually we get better. Sometimes we feel a little bit overwhelmed by our symptoms, as if we're really going to succumb to something and we need something to help us. But that's what the remedies do. They help us to recover. They help our, um, our immune system. They help our body's own healing responses to make us better. The, the remedy is the catalyst. It isn't a drug. We tend to give a single dose and wait and see. We're going to talk a little bit more about this later on as well. The single remedy is slightly contentious, as in modern homeopathy. Uh, many people utilize combination remedies uh, or alternation of remedies. But I guess classically, if we can see very clearly, as in that a situation of diarrhea, a remedy that matches really closely, we don't need another remedy. Arsenicum will cure that person of their diarrhea uh, and they will soon be feeling much, much better. So by and large, we're looking for the single remedy, but we don't need to be hidebound by it only being the single remedy. There are times where we may decide, I really can't tell between these two remedies uh, and I'm going to alternate them. Uh, and see if we get some good results. It's a possibility that you can do. But if we see the clear picture, then the single remedy is always preferable. The minimum dose. Hahnemann, when he realized that the quinine was causing malaria symptoms in patients, not malaria its, itself, but symptoms that uh, mimicked malaria, he realized that if he wanted to use quinine, uh, it, it would be easier, better, safer, more pleasant if he could get rid of the side effects. So he began by diluting and seeing how low he could go with dilutions before the cure became ineffective. And he developed a system of diluting and shaking, which is, um, is actually banging the remedy as it's diluted against a firm surface, often a book uh, or, or a hand. Um, and the succussion uh, process seems to be what actually shifts the energetics in the prescription. One C equals, and one, the C stands for centesimal. So that's one drop in 99 parts of alcohol. We use the um, X potencies as well, and that would be one drop in at nine parts of alcohol. But one drop in 99 parts is the centesimal, which is the commonest scale. And then you take one more drop and drop it into another 99 parts of alcohol. And then that's the 2C. This uh, is the reason homeopathy is very often open to criticism. Basically, by the time you reach something like a 200C potency, uh, it, the equivalent is uh, dropping one drop into the oceans of the world. Um, you know, as a homeopath of 35 years with a very busy practice and some outstanding results, even I think that's unlikely. You know? So I can understand how people go, I'll get away. <laughs> it does sound quite incredible. Uh, and, and so it's understandable that we get criticized for this because a lot of our modern drugs uh, are, they're chemicals. And Orthodox science often tries to understand 
uh, homeopathy by the same model, by the chemical model. And actually, I believe that homeopathy is, it is being understood now, but it's being understood by quantum physicists and it hasn't yet filtered down into the mainstream uh, because what we are, we are, we are diluting beyond Avogadro's number and Avogadro's number is the point in a solution where there is no longer possible for a single molecule to exist. So the, the quack busters, if you like, or the, the, the sense about science, the skeptics, they say, this is rubbish, this doesn't contain a single molecule, uh, how can it possibly work? And the answer is that it doesn't work by the system you're trying to explain it by. A, a, a way that, that makes some sense to me in helping to understand why homeopathy works, and clearly it does work. You know, between 200 and 300 million people throughout the world use homeopathy daily. Uh, so despite the best efforts of the skeptics, it's growing in popularity for no other reason than it works. And to me, it's a little bit like having a, having a, a, a CD and giving it to a chemist and saying, tell me what you find, analyze it, tell me what's in there. And they will analyze it and they'll say, well, there's vinyls, uh, there's metals, uh, there's plastics, um, there's hydrocarbons of this or that type. And you say, but did you find the Mozart? And they'll say, what do you mean? Well, there was music on there. Well, no. Well, the music is in the physics of it. The music isn't in the chemistry of the CD. So you can analyze it however you like chemically. You will never find the Mozart. And it's a little bit like that with homeopathy. I think we are still an idea ahead of its time. And when you think how long ago, I mean, homeopathy is not a new age system of medicine. Hahnemann uh, discovered homeopathy 200 years ago. So we're not looking at a new age hippie type of medicine. We're looking at a medicine that has a long and actually a really illustrious history. Uh, it, it, there have been homeopathy is still available on the NHS and again that's despite the best efforts of these people who want to see homeopathy uh, squashed out of uh, existence. But as homeopaths uh, and people who have used homeopathy um, there's no doubt that it works. Uh, patients come back time and time and time again uh, but it's this dilution and succussion that is the is the, um, the thing that makes homeopathy really different. It's the thing that makes homeopathy open to criticism because it's not understood, but it's the thing that makes homeopathy incredibly safe and incredibly effective. Um, potency selection. When we uh, have a, a patient that we want to give a remedy to to help to make them better, we sometimes have to decide what potency to give. The lower potencies, the X, or the decimal potencies, 6X to up to 6C, are considered low potencies. Medium potencies, 30C or 200C, and high potencies, 1M and above. But over-the-counter remedies and the remedies that we're going to use uh, for our acutes will usually be in the low to medium potency. Mostly we're going to use them in the 30s or perhaps the 200s, occasionally 60s. So those three potencies are the main potencies, 6, 30, 200. The remedy choice is far more important than the potency selection. That's the fine-tuning on a prescription. By and large, if the picture is really clear, if the symptoms are very strong, uh, we might go higher to a 200. If the symptoms are less clear, if the patient is really weak, we might stay slightly lower with a 30. But it doesn't really matter that much in acutes. I always say, what have you got? When, when, when a, a patient rings me up and they have a child maybe sick with a fever and I say, uh, give them belladonna, um, and they'll say, oh, I've only got a 60. That's all you've got, that's what you're going to give. Give it quite frequently. So the, the remedy will work, whatever the potency, uh, but it's fine tuning. There are sometimes a little bit, um, some of them are sometimes a little bit preferential, but mostly you're going to be uh, using from first aid kits or over the counter remedies that you're going to buy from health food shops, and you're going to be using 30 potency mostly. Uh, the 30s are a, a, a good choice for home prescribers who 
may have some familiarity with homeopathy, certainly hopefully after this course. Uh, and these can be given every four to six hours until the symptoms are relieved. If you only have a six, you might want to dose a little bit more frequently, perhaps every two to four hours. We're going to come over this again. You don't have to uh, remember this uh, in its entirety. You'll also uh, be able to review this when, when, the, when it's, uh, fil the film is released. Um, we'll, come, we'll touch on all of these things again through the course of the day. The last one on that list of the principles was the law of cure. Uh, the law of cure says that when we are helping to make someone better, this doesn't really matter so much for the acute prescribing that we are going to be doing today, but it's useful to understand this, that as your body heals, things move from inside to outside, from above uh, to down, from the centre to the periphery, and in reverse order of the original appearance of symptoms. If, if somebody is coming to a homeopath for... Um, a more chronic disease and they're seeing a homeopath and maybe uh, they have severe asthma and their health history is that they had um, eczema as a child, they've used steroids for years, the eczema is pretty much gone now but they have bad asthma and we, they want to come and have some treatment for their asthma. What we might find is that as we treat their asthma they'll say well my peak flow measure is actually getting better yeah, and I'm feeling a lot better. But you know, I've got this eczema that I had when I was five. I haven't had it really for the last seven, eight, nine years even. Uh, and it's just started to come back. We, that's part of the law of cure. We know we are moving the patient uh, on in the right direction. So, so these are the things that we look at to ascertain if our remedies are working well. Uh, and they're one of our uh, immutable laws of homeopathy. So prescribing remedies, we're going to talk a little bit about how to take a patient's case. So you, we're going to uh, just spend a little bit of time on that. But we need to know what our patient's symptoms are uh, in order for us to match that with the best remedy that we can find for them. And usually if we feel that we've made a pretty good match, we're going to take a single dose of that remedy. Uh, and then we are going to wait and see how the patient feels. This, this is, gets slightly complex here because healing is a process. Homeopathy isn't magic. Uh, it, healing is a process that takes time. If you, supposing you cut your arm really badly, you know, and it needed maybe 12 stitches, and we were to give you a remedy we're going to talk about later, calendula, you're not going to say, oh my God, there was a big, big cut there a minute ago. Look at that. That's, you know, I say we're homeopaths. We're not Harry Potter. So it's a process of healing. A, a, a big cut like that, it has to, the, the, the sides have to move together. There has to be granulation as the tissues knit together and a scab forms. And then the scab will come off and then there'll be a scar and the scar will fade. That's how healing happens, gently and steadily. So we can make sure that healing takes place and we can help it to take place a little quicker, but it still has to take place. So if you are treating um, somebody for flu, say, you're not going to give them a remedy and they're going to say, great, I'm off down the pub. That was brilliant. What they may say is actually, I feel a little bit less hot or I feel a little bit less achy. We're looking for signs that there may be some improvement. We may have to give them a few of our selected remedies. And then if we're starting after they've had two or three, if they're saying, yeah, I don't feel quite as wretched as I did, uh, or I haven't blown my nose every two seconds, it's slowing down a little. We know we're on the right tracks. We can keep prescribing until they feel really much better. And then we stop. There are situations like a teething baby. A baby screaming, is really in discomfort, he won't be put down. We give a dose of chamomilla, and that is like Harry Potter world. The baby goes, oh, and falls asleep. People go, did that really happen? That, that it happens all the time. It's a fantastic remedy, and we're going to talk about it. But occasionally, we get the symptom that just stops. If the symptom stops, we don't need to repeat the remedy. We don't need to give it again. 
we can say, okay, that symptom is no longer there. There's nothing to uh, prescribe on, so we'll wait. But if the baby falls asleep and wakes up and gets really, really cranky again and can't be soothed, you can give another one. So basically, we're, when we start to feel better, we stop or slow down with the dosing. Stop if it's completely better, slow down if there's good improvement, but keep going until we feel really we're over it now and we just need another day's rest to, to feel better. Um, it's, it's very much in contrast to the typical stay the course pharmaceutical approach. And it reflects the idea of Hahnemann to find the minimum effective dose that allows your body to heal itself. It's the reason why we don't have to keep on dosing indefinitely. Once that process has started, we can slow down and perhaps stop uh, and only uh, repeat if the symptoms return. This is based on the belief that too much medication of any sort, chemical or homeopathic, uh, is just uh, going to get in the way once the body has actually started the process. Sometimes patients uh, say to me, is this all I'm getting? You're only giving me um, three pills, one a week for three weeks for my arthritis and I'm not going to come and see you for another six weeks. So I'm going to be three weeks with nothing, is that right? And we say, yes, that's correct. But don't worry about that. The remedy will stay active in your system for a while because it's actually making your, your, your body do the work. And I liken it sometimes to uh, pushing a swing. You know, once you give the swing a push, you don't need to keep pushing it. In fact, if you push a swing that's got good momentum, you might disturb its momentum. So you push the swing and you let it swing for a while. And when it's obvious that it's slowing down, then you give it another push. And that's how it is with homeopathy. So we don't have to keep, keep, keep on dozing. And people are often surprised when they come back, they say, I'm amazed that those three little pills have done so much. You know, I was really, uh, you know, I have to say I was a little bit skeptical when you gave me, you know, those three little pills, but wow. Uh, and that's often the response that we get from, from patients when they first uh, discover homeopathy and discover how amazing the effects from just a few uh, very tiny pills are. And it's simply because it's not the pills themselves. It's what they do in your body. It's, it's about stimulating your body's own ability to heal itself. What are remedies made from, sometimes people will ask. And the answer to that is actually almost anything. Mostly the remedies are, they come from one of the three kingdoms of nature, plants, animals or minerals. Um, but there are more homeopathic remedies being proved for use all the time. So our catalogue of remedies increases, I guess, in accordance with changes in the modern world. Um, the remedies may, as in our Seneca album, may be made from toxic, dangerous substances in the first place, which are rendered safe by the homeopathic dilution processes. But some of them are fairly innocuous in the first place, such as salt. But we all know that salt can kill people if we overdo, overdo it. So there's very few things that can't cause harm if we are very indiscriminate with them. Uh, the remedies that come from the animal kingdom, um, we will be talking about two of them, I think, today. One of them is apis mel, which is uh, made from the venom of a honeybee. Some people don't like to use animal remedies, and I completely uh, understand that. In homeopathy's defense for people who are vegan, um, what I would say is that usually the homeopathy, the death, there has it's resulted in the death of perhaps one honeybee uh, to treat hundreds of thousands of patients. Uh, so it's not like we have to kill colonies of honeybees. The, the, probably the bee that we still use today uh, for our source of apis mel may have been killed 50 or 60 years ago. So it's actually very cruelty free apart from that single source. Homeopathic remedies aren't tested on animals and in fact they're also used, um, there are veterinary homeopaths who use them to heal animals so it gives back a little bit too I like to think. Um, but some people still say I don't want to be given any remedies from the animal kingdom. 
There aren't that many of them. I would say the majority of our remedies come from the plant kingdom and quite a few come from the kingdom of minerals like arsenicum uh, and like salt. We use many minerals as well. But we do use a few of the remedies from the animal kingdom and when they are needed, they are in incredibly useful. So as I said, remedies aren't tested on, on animals. They're environmentally friendly. Um, but we are developing remedies all the time because we find that people are affected by things. We might have a remedy made from organophosphates, for instance, from people who've been made ill by exposure uh, to pesticides. So although we have a, a stock of well-tried and tested remedies that have provings and clinical provings, and we're going to come back to that word in a minute, uh, over the years, we also add in new remedies uh, into the, the pharmacopoeia of homeopathic remedies. What is a proving? Well, if you remember Hahnemann's experiments with quinine that we talked about, that he took the substance until he developed symptoms. And this is what we do with uh, provings. Uh, a group of people will take a potentized dose of the remedy every day until they develop symptoms. For some people that may be after 10 days, for some they'll be taking it for a month before they notice anything. But then once they start to notice a shift in their symptoms, they make very, very careful notes of their symptoms. And then they, it's kind of done a bit double blind. They don't know what they're taking. Um, and the person who collates all the information doesn't know what the remedy is so that there's no uh, bias uh, creeps in. Then everything is collated and all the symptoms, if, if, if all of the provers have one symptom and that everybody has it very strongly, then it's known as a black type symptom. It's a very strong symptom of that remedy. And if only a few provers have had a symptom and it was fairly mild, then it's downgraded to a less important symptom. But this is how all of our remedies have originally been proved and then of course we have what we call clinical provings, clinical experience with remedies over the years adds more information onto the back of that original proving. Um, that just says what I've just said. <laughs> but basically uh, when a clear symptom picture emerges then that remedy is ready to be put into uh, the service of suffering humanity. So today we're going to be talking about acute problems and as I said we're not going to be treating chronic diseases. Uh, treating chronic ill health is something that you need to uh, do a lot of studying with homeopathy for. Most courses are around four years uh, and so we can't possibly hope to, to do that in a day but certainly a day is enough to whet your appetite uh, uh, and give you some interest in the subject uh, and uh, perhaps you will want to study it further. But the definition of an acute disease is that it's self-limiting. It Usually an acute disease will have a quick onset, it will follow a very typical pattern and it will come to a very clear end which will either result in complete recovery or death. Mostly recovery, I'm thankful to say. Uh, examples might be coughs, colds, mumps, tonsillitis. So mostly people who get acute Ill illnesses are ill for a short time. Maybe a flu might take up to two weeks for them to recover. Maybe three weeks if it was a really bad one. A cold might take four or five days. But mostly people who have acute illnesses are ill for a short time. With homeopathy, we aim to make them more comfortable whilst they're ill and to shorten the duration of their illness and make sure that their body can throw off the illness with as much speed and force as is possible for them to recover their health quickly. Um, Hahnemann believed that acutes were easier to treat as sometimes, not always, there's a very specific remedy for a specific condition. This is not foolproof, but for instance, rust tox is often said to be the main remedy for chicken pox. You would say that it probably will help 8 out of 10 cases of chicken pox. There may be people who have slightly different symptoms and who need a slightly different remedy if the rust tox isn't working, but for some illnesses there are very specific remedies that require a little bit less of the um, 
the individualization simply because the symptoms are pretty much identical. Another one, um, homeopathy won its laurels uh, with um, epidemic diseases uh, in the turn of the century. Uh, what, one of them was uh, scarlet fever and uh, homeopathy had great success with scarlet fever at the time and scarlet fever was a really serious disease not scarlatina as it is nowadays but there were big contagion hospitals and children used to die of, of scarlet fever and homeopathy really uh, won its laurels in the treatment of scarlet fever and yet this is one of the diseases that has a very specific remedy belladonna because the symptoms of scarlet fever are very strong and everybody has the same they develop a rash very very red but they have a circumoral pallor, which means the rash doesn't extend to the area around their mouth. Their tongue is very, very red, but has white dots on it, so it looks like a white strawberry. They have a high temperature. So everybody has those symptoms, so the chances are they're going to need the same remedy. Uh, so acutes can be easier for that reason. But as we learned when we talked about bronchitis, there are other acutes that require careful examination of the symptoms in order for us to find the very specific remedy. So an acute remedy is a, a remedy which, it, it, acute remedy, acute remedy is a remedy for acute ailments, but acute ailments are um, self-limiting uh, diseases as opposed to a chronic disease. Some people say, oh, it was really chronic, as if something means chronic equals bad. That's not actually what chronic means. Chronic means that it is a long-term disease. It's probably not going to kill you, but you're going to have to live with it for a long time. There will be symptoms that don't clear up. Uh, they may change somewhat in nature, but they last a long time. Arthritis is a, an example of that. You know, people say, oh, I've had it for the last 30 years, and I this now and that now. Uh, and there's no... Uh, there, it's very rare that it will spontaneously clear up. So uh, the chronic will come on slowly, it will last sometimes forever, and will rarely result in, in death, although there are a few that do. Um, whereas acutes are um, short and usually it re result in spontaneous recovery. Um, the acutes as I say, are where homeopathy really became best known at the turn of the century. Um, it, it was an amazing remedy for treating a Spanish flu. I think in uh, uh, 1919, uh, at the, in, in the war, at the end of the First World War, there was a, a deadly outbreak of Spanish flu. Um, millions of people died and homeopathy really came into its own in that sort of situation. And in the book Chronic Diseases, Hahnemann wrote that he used bryonia or rustox as specific remedies during an epidemic of uh, acute typhoid that broke out in London. Uh, he treated 180 cases and only lost two patients. In a cholera epidemic in England, the mortality rate at the London Homeopathic Hospital was 9% whilst in the allopathic hospitals it was 59%. So these are indisputable figures. These aren't um, made up. These are cl clearly researchable and verifiable. Uh, and when we see how homeopathy works in epidemic diseases, it really is very, the statistics are really compelling. And so treating acutes has been something that homeopathy has always uh, been uh, very well known for. So we're nearly uh, nearly time to move on to the remedies themselves. I'm sure that's uh, what you're looking forward to. But just some terms that we'll be using uh, when we're talking about remedies and uh, case taking. So one of the words we're going to use is modalities. A modality are the things that make a symptom feel better or worse. So if somebody has a sore throat and you say, is there anything that makes it feel better? They might say, yes, if, if, I, if I have a warm drink, my throat will feel better for that. That's a modality. Or they might say, oh, I've got a splitting headache. And you say, what makes it worse? If I move my head at all, uh, if I stay completely still, 
it's about 3 out of 10. If I move slightly, it goes up to 10 out of 10. That's a modality. Um, they're written for, when we say better for, we use the mathematical increasing sign. That means better for. And if we use the mathematical decreasing sign, that means worse for. You don't necessarily have to know that shorthand, uh, but if you ever see it written down in a book, that's what that means. So we're going to ask our patient for their modalities. Also, another word that we see written uh, in a lot of first aid books is concomitant. This is a secondary symptom, which might seem unrelated to the first symptom, but it comes along at the same time. For instance, it might be somebody who's got joint pain accompanied by nausea. There doesn't seem to be a relationship between the two, but they say, whenever that comes, I feel nauseous. They come at the same time. That's uh, concomitant. Etiology. We want to know what was the causative factor. That's what etiology means. If somebody said, well, I have a sore throat, but I was singing in the choir over the weekend and I think I've strained my voice. That is the etiology for their sore throat. Um, it might be that somebody said, well, I got a terrible fright. Um, my son fell down the stairs and I thought he'd hit his head really badly. Uh, he actually was okay. But an hour later, I started with this headache. So that might be the etiology, ailments from a fright. So if we can see an etiology, that's useful. When we are taking the case of one of our family, perhaps, uh, we need to take quite a lot of information so that we can differentiate between the remedies that we might think of choosing for them. And we use the word CLAMS as a, an abbreviation for, for questions that we need to ask. When somebody says, I have a sore throat, we're going to go through the CLAMS. CLAMS stands for concomitant, location, etiology, modalities, and sensation. So I'm going to give you some examples of this. So perhaps your family have all gone down with a sore throat and you're the only one that's not got a sore throat, so they're all queuing up for you to say, Mum, give me a remedy to make me better. So, uh, or Dad, give us a remedy to make us feel better. So if we have one of the family, perhaps the son, uh, he has a sore throat, and he says, is there anything else going on at the same time? And he may say, yeah, I've got a bit of a headache. You know, a bit of a, my head hurts a bit at the front. The location might be, is it worse on your left side or your right side, or is it in the centre of your throat? Whereabouts exactly do you feel the pain? Uh, so you might say, it's on the right side. Um, and say, is there something that seemed to set it off? Uh, yeah, I ate, uh, I ate a peach and I'm slightly allergic to peaches and my tongue started tingling and then my throat started to get sore and I think it's possibly an allergic reaction to the peach. So there you have an etiology too. Um, you might say anything that's making it better or worse and they say well actually if I suck ice or drink something really cold it feels nice, it feels like it gets rid of some of the swelling uh, and the sensation, well it's stinging, it's like a stinging pain. When we go through throat, sore throats we'll see that this would fit the picture of apis. The, all of these things, the concomitant, the location, the etiology, the modality and the sensation, they fit that remedy. And they might be very different uh, to taking the case perhaps of, of the mum or the dad who has the sore throat, who says that they've got a sore throat. And you say, is there a concomitant? No, nope, nothing else going on, just the throat. Um, and whereabouts in your throat? Is it right or left? Nope, it's right in the middle, right in the centre. Um, and what was the etiology? The singing in the choir. I sang, we had rehearsals on Friday, we had rehearsals all day Saturday and we had a performance on Sunday and now I really can't speak. Uh, what makes it feel better? If I suck a, a, a sweet or drink something warm, sometimes gargling with a warm drink and the sensation is raw. So in this situation we might be looking at the remedy Russ talks for overuse of the voice. And it's quite different in its symptoms to the other sore throat that we've just seen uh, that the son had. And then the daughter saying, I've got a sore throat too. Um, and you might say, is there anything else going on other than your sore throat? Yeah, I'm freezing. I, I'm actually really cold. I've got the heating on. I've got three jumpers on. I've got a blanket around me. I still feel cold. 
so the concomitant might be the chill. Is it your right or your left side? It's my left side. It's distinctly the left side. It really, really hurts. Was there an etiology? Well, I think it was because I got a chill yesterday. It was sub-zero temperatures. I had to wait three hours for a bus. I didn't have warm enough clothes on. There was a really, really cold wind. My throat started to get sore and this has come on. So maybe the etiology was being out in the cold wind or getting a chill. Uh, anything that makes it better or worse. Uh, any, any cold makes it worse. Cold air, cold drinks. A warm drink might be quite soothing. And what's the sensation? Like a fish bone stuck in my throat. So here we have the clear symptoms of a remedy called Heparsulf. I'm going to go over some of these remedies when we do sore throats. So you can see there that in that little demonstration of, of three acute sore throats, that although they're all sore throats, that they are different sore throats. And our way of finding out how different are they is by getting the clams. So that's just a, um, a little aid into case taking and getting the information we need. The case taking for an acute disease is very different from the case taking for a chronic disease. If you have a chronic disease like migraines or arthritis or something that isn't going and you consult a homeopath, that process will take an hour to an hour and a half and it will include your previous health history, your family health history, uh, your appetite and aversions, your sleep patterns, your body temperature and your character. So we need an awful lot of information uh, when we are treating somebody um, for a chronic disease. But for an acute disease, we don't need to know what happened before. We just need to know what's different since you've been ill. What symptoms are different since you've been ill? Uh, and that's what we base them on. And asking these uh, clams gives us a, just a, a framework for getting the information we need so that we can then uh, apply the correct remedy. So we are now going to go on to looking at the remedies themselves. Hurrah! I hear you say. Before we do that, uh, that's quite a lot of information that we've just been through, albeit uh, uh, just a taster of the information. Uh, that kind of philosophical part of homeopathy is actually, there's a lot to it. It's quite deep and it's quite complex. And uh, if you study homeopathy, that forms quite a lot, especially in your first year of your course. But is there anything anybody particularly wants to ask about that before we move on to the next section? Yeah, just one last one. Even this cancer, where do you place it under acute, uh, acute or chronic illness? A cancer? Yeah. Oh, definitely chronic. chronic. Yes, yes. Uh, cancer, uh, you know, some chronics, I said, most chronics you're not going to die of, but there are some, some chronic things that you, you might die of. And cancer kind of is slightly different. But when... Cancer is something which has been a part of a chronic process, chronic toxicity, chronic ill health, possible chronic suppression. It's taken a long time for your body to get into that position. Uh, and it may take a long time for your body to begin to recover. As homeopaths, we never say we treat a disease. We always say we treat the patient and we treat them to try and help them to deal with whatever their health problem is. Uh, but uh, cancer is definitely not an acute problem. Curable. You know, it's a, it's a big question. It's hard to say is cancer curable because we don't actually treat the cancer, we treat the patient. And some patients are curable of whatever they've got wrong with them. And some patients, maybe they're very sick, maybe they're very weak, maybe they just don't have a lot of healing resources. Uh, uh, some people die from common cold. You know, so we don't like to say that homeopathy can cure this. What we can say is we treat people and we treat people with all manner of diseases. I mean, really all manner of diseases and we get really good results. But the treatment of anything other than acute diseases has to be seen by a professional homeopath. These acute things we're going to be talking about today, uh, as long as you adhere to, we, we've got the information from St. John's Ambulance for what you should do in an acute situation. And as long as you adhere to those guidelines, it's perfectly safe to treat acute remedies at home with these, uh, these remedies. You can't possibly do any harm. You can only do good. And the more you get really good results with the remedies, the more your confidence grows in the prescribing of them. But we're strictly talking about acutes. Any other questions? I would like to ask, 
what about children when they can't explain actually the modality of the sensation? They can't explain the clumps, the mother has to observe. That's a very, very good question, Valentina. Thank you. Um, that's a very good question because that does happen with children. But sometimes mums, maybe they have a small child, they still can tell some of the information why they think it came on the etiology is cutting a teeth, a uh, cutting a tooth. They may still know the etiology. They may say it's his left side because it's all red on the left. So we may still, it's often more observation is used, but the mum will also be able to often tell you whether they're cranky, whether they're tearful, whether they, you know, it is more observational, but it doesn't mean we can't get a case. Uh, yeah, it, it does require slightly different skills. We're not asking so many questions because the baby can't answer us, but we may be asking the, the mum uh, of the baby or the mum may be looking and trying to ascertain as much information as possible if it's a baby. So it's a good question. It's slightly different, isn't it? Because we can't yes. say to them what makes it feel better. But we can observe sometimes what makes them feel better, what they refuse, what, they, what they're welcoming, whether they seem to want to be uncovered or covered up whether they want to be held or left alone, whether they're hot and red. So we're going to use a lot more observational skills uh, when we're dealing with very young babies. But I find that children are often very happy to answer the questions from the age of three and a half, maybe. As soon as they've got the verbal skills, they're quite keen to get involved. <laughs>
a remedy may fit more than one complaint and we may do a remedy recap which helps you remember them and when we do the remedy recaps you'll see that these are the words that are coming up whatever the complaint is so I've put the remedy uh, in plain type but the keynote words that are really going to be important for you to remember if you want to be able to remember the remedies are the words in bold type so arnica as I say probably the best known remedy in the world for for trauma uh, and I think, you know, whenever you say, you know, homeopathy, or if I say I'm a homeopath, people say, oh, homeopathy, what's that? And I say, arnica, oh, yeah, arnica. <laughs> Immediately they know, they know what it is. Oh, yeah, arnica, that's great, isn't it? Um, and any traumatic injury to the body may require arnica. It's specific for bruises, but in any emotional shock, trauma, uh, you might we're going to cover burns but even if somebody burns themselves if they've been quite traumatized by it you may start with arnica before you move on to any any burn remedy so it's for trauma generally 100 percent any traumas that people have arnica may be able to help with but specifically for blows injuries falls and bruises and it's great for bruises you know sometimes you knock yourself really really hard and um, it's starting to bruise and swell immediately and the arnica can really help to deal with that and very occasionally you sprain your ankle or something and you take arnica and the ar ankle becomes black it actually brings the bruising out sometimes so it can either uh, stop the bruising coming out if it's given early enough or depending on the type of injury but occasionally it, it brings the bruising to the surface to, to clear it uh, but it's an absolutely amazing remedy and something that most people most people know about it's used in in countless homes across the world uh, and when children injure themselves they say supposing your child falls off their high chair they say the gap between the impact and the cry will tell you how how much they need arnica if there's no impact, often they say it means there's no shock. They possibly don't need it as long as they're not, they obviously haven't hurt themselves. But when you hear a thump and a few minutes later you hear that, ah, that's a sign that they've been shocked. They're kind of almost shocked out of themselves for a moment. And that's a sign that they, they may uh, do well with a, a dose of, of arnica. Sometimes when people have been really unwell, maybe you'll see somebody they've been not seriously injured but they've been clipped by a car and thrown and fallen on the floor uh, and it, you know you run over are you okay and they get up to their feet and they'll all say yes yes I'm fine I'm fine no, no really I'm fine and you think I'm sure you can't be fine you were just hit by a car and knocked backwards into the road you know well let me get you a glass of water come and sit down no honestly I'm fine leave me alone I'm fine this is something that Arnica often do when they're ill if it's a stranger there's not very much you can do uh, you can offer them arnica, you can give them a seat, bring them some water, but you can't force it down them. If it's a family member, you might say, actually, you're really not fine, and I'm going to give you some of the arnica out of the first aid kit. But that, I'm okay. I don't know if you've seen the Monty Python film where the knights who say knee, they're fighting, and one gets a leg cut off or something, and he's hopping about, and they say, you've lost your leg. No, it's a flesh wound, it's a flesh wound, I'm fine. That's a very arnica state, you know. Honestly, I'm fine. When you can see that they're not fine, uh, so sometimes they, they downplay the severity of what's happened to them. After a shock or a trauma, sometimes people feel almost as if they've been kicked or beaten they feel kind of bruised everywhere even you know sometimes that happens when people have been in a car accident and they think oh i'm okay that was lucky i got away with that but it was it was a big fright the car spun around but luckily everyone's fine but they may wake up the next day and they may feel oh god i feel like you know i've been through the mangle uh, and that's just the effect of the tension that, that they did and the shock uh, and that they've held that tension and that they've got lactic acid in their muscles and arnica can ease that sense of bruised and beaten feeling after someone's had a shock. In a typical arnica state, um, they may feel muscular soreness and restlessness. As well as that muscular soreness, they will be re almost like, you know, oh, it hurts to lie on that side. Ah, I'm going to move around, I'm going to move and I'm going to lie, I'm going to lie and that, oh no, that hurts just as much. And they find it very 
difficult to get a comfortable position. It's a wonderful remedy for injuries and as well as relieving the shock and the trauma, it can, it can relieve pain. It's, uh, I'll tell you a story that I like that I, when I was studying, a homeopath came to teach us from America. He had a big clinic in Arizona and was a very well-known homeopath and a great teacher. And uh, he told me a story, and since then I've always kept Arnica in my glove compartment of the car. He told me that he was out, um, in his, he had like a four before thing, and he was driving along the top uh, of some, a canyon, and he saw a guy on horseback go down uh, into one of the, I guess, a, a, um, like a path down into the canyon. And as he watched him, he saw the horse stumble and fell, and they fell over the lip of the road, onto the one below and the man landed underneath the horse and the horse couldn't get up. So he phoned, what did they phone in America, 9-11, got his arnica out of the first, out of his glove compartment, ran down uh, until he got to the man and he said, I phoned 9-11 um, and uh, you know, I'm here to help you, but the man was trapped under the horse, his legs were pinned, he was in serious pain, uh, it looked like the horse was badly injured and so he gave the man some arnica and he said, don't worry, I'm going to stay with you. Ambulance is on its way, or the, I think it was an airlift actually, but he said they're on their way. I'll stay with you till they're here. Um, and every so often he was giving him some arnica. Then the ambulance came, they took him away to the hospital. And the guy went to see how he'd got on. He found where he'd gone, gone to the hospital. And he said, oh, hi, do you remember me? He said, oh, God, he said, I am so glad to see you. He said, I've been trying to find out who you were. You saved my life that day. He said, if you hadn't been there and hadn't seen, I might have lain there for days. I might have died. He said, I was so lucky that you saw me. He said, not only that, I was even luckier that you had that morphine with you. <laughs> and he said, what, what, what do you mean? He said, well, that morphine stuff you gave me, that really strong painkiller that you gave me? He said, oh, that wasn't morphine. He said, what was it then? I thought, some, some similar thing, what was it? He said, no, it was arnica. It's a homeopathic remedy. And he told him about it. He said, I'm a homeopath, and this is what homeopathy does. He said, I can't believe that. Well, the moral of the story as to why you should carry your arnica in your glove compartment was it turned out that he was a multi-billionaire and he set the homeopath up in a great big clinic in Arizona where he still works from. <laughs> so grateful was he for the homeopathic morphine that was in fact arnica. So it's capable of causing uh, great pain relief in someone who's in a very distressing situation and is an absolutely uh, amazing remedy. Nowadays you may, if you are having surgery, your hospital may say, please don't take Arnica before surgery um, uh, or after surgery, uh, as it will make you bleed. Well, as a homeopath, we would give something similar to the suffering. So there's no suffering happened before an operation. So I personally would never give it before an operation. I would only ever give it after an operation. But I have to say, I have used it after surgery for my patients in, I wouldn't be able to count. I mean, I would be well past 5,000, maybe even past 10,000 people who I've given it to post-surgery. And they all, without exception, it's commented on. The surgeons actually say to them, oh my goodness, you're doing really well. You know, how are you, how are you up and about? Or how are you so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed? And they say, Arnica. Sometimes the surgeon goes, oh, great stuff. Other times they go, hmm. Uh, but the nurses, one, m my friend had a, um, a, a mastectomy and one of the nurses said, you're up and about, you know, you're going to go and sort of wash your hair. Everyone else is still lying in there with their chest drains in and, uh, you know, moaning and on their morphine pump. How are you doing so well? And she said, well, I think it's the arnica. And the nurse said, Do you know, we have it in the nurse's station, but we're not allowed to give it to the patients. And yet, without exception, uh, the co it's commented on by the doctors, the surgeons, and the nursing staff, how much more quickly people heal when they have been uh, given, given Arnica. It's, uh, it's, it's essential, in my view. Uh, it's useful after dental procedures, uh, especially extraction. That uh, can be quite traumatic and a lot of 
tugging and pulling and uh, it's, uh, you know wisdom teeth my friend had bruising on her chest because the dentist almost had to get his foot on her chest and and pull out and she said i got a bruise on my chest as well lucky didn't break her ribs but uh, uh, you know it's it, when, when dental surgery has been a little traumatic it will help to calm down the inflammation and again speed up the healing it's a fantastic remedy um during labor and afterwards uh, if uh, if the person who's having the baby is uh, into homeopathy they can have a, a homeopathic first aid kit and take it into the hospital with them and again it's completely safe uh, no harm can come to the mother or the baby uh, that's one of the wonderful things about remedies that you can give them and if they don't work they just don't work that's it nothing else and if they work then bingo you've got the right remedy you, you, you're you going to be really pleased and the, the mother uh, in labour is going to be really pleased so arnica is always in kits for labour sometimes mums just feel I'm exhausted uh, they, you know they don't call it labour for nothing and they just say I've had it I'm done and you can give them some uh, Ignatia, some, uh, I'm losing the plot now, some Arnica under their tongue. And it's almost like, woo, you know, like when you see boxers and they give them water and a cold sponge and then they're up and they're back into the ding, ding, round two. And it's like that. It's just like, oh, OK, back in the game. And it really makes a difference to them. And afterwards, labour, women experience it very differently. But for some women, they have a very long very complicated, very tiring and painful labour. And I see that quite a few patients that I see with postnatal depression, actually I think they have post-traumatic stress disorder. And I will say that, you know, to a, when any of my patients are going to have a baby, I say, don't forget your arnica. Take it after the childbirth. Take it for a few days. And I say to my students when we're studying Arnica, I say, if you've had a baby, or if not, if your friends or your sister or anyone else has had a baby, dig out the first, the first pictures of them with their baby, still in their hospital greens or in what they were delivered in, you know, still here all over the place, lovely baby, and they're smiling at the camera. If you get a piece of paper, you'll see that their mouth is smiling at the camera and their eyes are going, what just happened to me? <laughs> and that means they were in an arnica state. And if they get arnica, it can relieve a lot of that shock, trauma, not only to the body, uh, but to the spirit. Uh, and I think can help prevent sometimes um, postnatal depression. Not always, because sometimes it's a hormonal issue. But quite often, I do think that it may be a, 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 a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. But it's brilliant after childbirth. And uh, it, uh, it really helps hugely. And so the next one there, shock, that says it all really. Any, any sort of shock, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic remedy. It's useful for both acute and chronic, certain chronic. We're not going to be using it that way. And sometimes maybe we should say recent and remote. One of my first ever uh, proper cases when I qualified as a homeopath was a man who had, um, I've forgotten what you call it now, um, where you fall asleep all the time. Sleep. Nope. Narcolepsy. Thank you. Narcolepsy. Brain's, brain's just gone. Um, he had narcolepsy and he had also started to develop a heart condition because he was on speed, basically. He was on, he'd been on amphetamines for 25 years because he would fall asleep in his dinner. He'd fall asleep. He wasn't allowed to drive if he didn't take them. He would, you know, it was a, a very complex case. And he fell asleep everywhere, but he also had really horrible nightmares at night. The narcolepsy came after he had a head injury. And... Uh, the symptoms uh, of the falling asleep and the horrible dreams were the things that affected him most. He, he, the night before he told me he dreamt he was casting a fishing line and it whipped back and he pulled his own eye out. Really horrible dreams like that. Those were the kind of things and he'd wake up <gasps> with a shudder. Uh, and I gave him Arnica 
Uh, I didn't know where to go with this. I didn't know quite. I was quite uh, inexperienced. And I thought, well, I do know the etiology. And the etiology was a head injury. Uh, and there was a few other symptoms that he had that uh, uh, the uh, arnica uh, suited. I gave him arnica. It was 35 years after the initial incident. And it wasn't the only remedy he needed, but it was an amazing remedy. How much better he felt after it, how the nightmares disappeared. And slowly, slowly, he regained his health. But arnica was a remedy he needed, even though the injury was so far ago. We also can get arnica cream. The only, and you can use that on, uh, you know, bruises and bangs and head injuries. The only proviso with this is that it's not meant to be used on broken skin. It can irritate broken skin. But as long as the skin isn't broken, you can use uh, arnica on uh, any bruises, any bangs or knocks that are painful. And we're not going to be talking about these now because they're slightly more um, in-depth problems. But when the symptoms agree, sometimes arnica can be used for gout, flu and boils. So it's a, it's a, a big remedy. And as I say, it's, a, it's probably one of the best known remedies uh, in the world homeopathically. I always think, you know how when you're talking about um, recreational drugs and newspapers often say that cannabis is the gateway drug to harder drugs. Well, I always think arnica is our gateway drug. <laughs> it's our gateway drug to people try it and they go, oh my God, this stuff's great, you know, and then they get onto the harder pulsatillas and such like. <laughs> but I do th so I think it's, the, it's, our, it's our gateway drug. It's most people's introduction into homeopathy and they may have that, oh, I'm not sure about this homeopathy. And they try it either after an operation or after an illness and they go, oh my God, I feel so much better. How, can, how did that just happen? So, yes, I think of it as the homeopathic gateway drug. Mm -hmm. Quick question. Pre-operative, some homeopaths still suggest that you take it, but the only reason is if you don't bleed a lot. Is that right? Uh, do you know, it's, it's, Arnica is in the rubric for excessive bleeding after operations. It actually can help. It, it does what your body requires it to do. Some people are going to bleed after surgery. I don't believe it's anything to do with any arnica that they take. But my advice, and that's only my advice, other homeopaths do different things. My advice would be uh, to take it after when you actually have the symptoms that you're trying to clear. I believe that a remedy is only homeopathic when it's given in combination with the symptoms. In other words, it's similar to the suffering because it isn't the remedy, it isn't the drug. It's your body, it's the action it has in your body. So it has to be similar to the suffering. So to give it when you're not suffering doesn't really make sense to me. So well, some homeopaths do it. I certainly don't think it can be harmful and uh, I don't think uh, that it will do any harm, but I always give it afterwards just because that's what I've always done and that's what I advise for my patients.